I guess if I had to give my thoughts on how player performance so far in month one, Brandon Nimmo is an all-star, hands down. There's no question about that. I think he's, if he keeps messing around like this, he could be an MVP talks. I mean, he's been very good. I know he got off to a little bit of a slow start, but he's been very good since that slow start. It's incredible to see his improvement in center field. I mean, three or four web gems in the past two or three days alone. He had two amazing catches in one game. And th these are not just like, oh, it's the middle, of, it's the, you know, bottom of the second and there's no one on base. Like this is like game saving catches. Like if he doesn't make this catch, ball game's tied, ball game's, we're, we're losing or we will, we all have lost. So, I mean, highlight real catches to, to, uh, to accompany his uh, like ever improving offense. You know, I think from defense, per, defensive perspective, he went from, He's a liability in center field. He's costing us runs to he's a gold. I think he's a gold glove candidate this year and an MVP candidate. Am I a little too high on Brandon Nimmo? I don't think so. The 315 batting average and a 472 on base percentage thanks to 15 walks. I mean, I can't imagine anyone else at the top of that lineup. He is the headlight and he's done wonders for us. And the fact that he's now mixing stolen bases into his repertoire and that's going to be a major part of his game. Uh, you know, obviously not, you don't want to throw the Mike Trout-esque. You don't want to throw that around. Mike Trout, no, don't throw that around. But a lot more tools in the arsenal than we uh, probably a lot of fans originally thought. So uh, I'm, you know, I said this about Nimmo in, I guess when he kind of first year or two, it could, I don't think it was 2017, might've been 2017 or 2018, I was like, this guy is awesome. And I know like the Jesus stuff may throw throw some people off or like the, the fact that he smiles a lot or the fact that he runs the first base during a base on balls. All that might throw you off, but I just think it makes him like a one unique character. <laughs> one that is going to be around for a long time thanks to that mega contract that we handed him. So I'm 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 very excited to have him. And the only thing that can derail this whole uh parade that we got going on for this love fest is injuries because i know that he is susceptible to injuries and i don't know that he's played a full season it might have been last year was his first full season that he's and i'm by full i mean like not every game but like he didn't miss more than half the season um tommy fam dude what 35 year old tommy fam Fourth highest OPS plus behind Alonzo, Nimmo, and Lindor. More total bases than Eduardo in less plate plate appearances. Against left-handed pitching this season, he's 7 for 23, which is 304 average with two uh, ding dongs. Two homers. That's uh that's cool. I'm glad because I, I I thought uh, like the originally the signing was like, oh my God. Like we can't our average age is going up. Like, what's going on? But I, I do think it makes sense to have a healthy mix of Wiley Vets, been been there, done that, playoff experience, World Series experience, with the youngins who haven't been doing all that kind of stuff that often. I think that's good. But you can see the downside of it. Verlander, Scherzer, you know, um, I'm sure Robertson's going to go on the IL at some point this season. Ottavino might. I mean, these are guys that are getting up in age. Um, so... You know, that's the downside, but Tommy Pham has been pretty awesome so far, and it's all thanks to LASIK. I think he, or not LASIK. Did he have eye surgery or he just got new contacts? I think he just got new contacts. It's incredible. You kind of overlook, pun intended, your vision um, until you get it fixed and you're like, oh my God, I've been missing everything. <laughs> you're a man? So. Good on Tommy Fam. I think now that Beatty's up, maybe he loses at bats to Escobar, who might be the DH, take on the DH role more often now. Although, you know, if it's a defensive issue, Beatty seems to be getting better. So is Beatty better than Escobar defensively? Maybe not, but maybe. And then offensively, he's definitely better than Escobar right now. So I just think the the lineup and the roster has a a good deal of flexibility, you know, and Buck has touched on it, at least with Luis Guillaume, his ability to play multiple positions is amazing. Shortstop, second, third. Um, I saw they had Mark Hanna at first base. They have Jeff McNeil in the outfield. So there's talk about possibly putting Beatty out there if you want to have Escobar start uh, at third. 
So is Tommy Pham the odd man out? I hope not. I don't think so because he is he is playing so well above what we had expected or hoped for. What does that do for LaCastro? I think maybe LaCastro, I think he just went on IL. Like he seems to be really a stolen base specialist at this point and a hit by a batsman, <laughs> hit by pitch specialist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's the happy Gilmore of the 2023 Mets. So I think LaCastro is the odd man out now. Um, but it's good to see that Tommy Pham has been able to contribute like he has. Uh, Jeff McNeil is not exactly playing, hitting at the clip he did last year when they won the Silver Slugger Award. He's been a bit off, but I feel like he'll come around. I don't know that this is going to be a situation where, and I hope this isn't the case, where like he has, you know, great season, bad season, great season, bad season, great season. Like, I really hope that's not the case. Um, you know, I, I just, just give it time. You know, uh, there's so many games. He's going to get so many more opportunities. It's not like he's completely in the toilet. You know, he's not batting. I mean, Vogelback, Canna, Escobar, uh, Alvarez, like he's not at the bottom of the heap there. So uh, I I do think it's just a matter of tweaking one things or two things or just get, you know, getting a nice blue pit, you know, a Baltimore chop, a Texas league or something, some cheap, cheapo hit. And then that's just kind of breaks the snide. So Vogelback, we talked about people getting on his case because they want him to slug the ball. And it's like, well, this is a case in point of like what to expect from him. He's hitting 200, not great. But he's got an on-base percentage of 392, which is second on the team. He walks a shit ton. Um, and I think if he played every day like Nimmo, he would have more more base on balls than Nimmo. I think he's like four behind Nimmo, and he hasn't played in that many uh, as many games. And then Polar Bear. Big Pete meat. Big meat Pete. Either way, you know what I'm talking about. Pete Alonzo. 58 Polar Bears, 154 career home runs have either tied the game or given the Mets the lead. His 150th career home run in his 538th career game is the second fastest in Major League um, history to reach that mark. Only Ryan Howard reached Ryan Howard reached that number in a few game fewer games. So is that the case? Like, is is that the deal with Alonzo, is that his legacy? Like he's going to be our version of Ryan Howard. I don't hate that. Ryan Howard went to two World Series, won one, lost one. So if he goes to two World Series and wins one, loses one, I think I'd I think I'd be cool with that. <laughs> just just get a ring. That'd be sweet. A ring would be great. So uh, yeah, I'm fine with that, you know, because I think Howard got kind of like he his first year in the league was 24, 25, I think. And I think Alonzo was on the older side as well. So I'm cool with that, but man, does he mash? And he mashes him like that. That um, that stat reveals like he mashes and he's kind of clutch. He mashes mashes in big spots, and I do dig like his home run trot type thing now, where he hits it and then he's he's got it in his left hand and then he immediately like slaps the barrel of the bat into his right hand and then flips it with his right hand. That's cool. And then the the whole no handshake thing with the third base coach. Sort of lame, but also sort of like that's so Pete. So like it's so fitting to his character that I uh, I dig that as well. Um, so, uh, you know, when he goes and when Lindor goes, they don't lose a lot of games. Speaking of Lindor, he's leading the team in RBIs. I think P. Alonso might be leading the league in home runs. If he's not, he's two or three. Lindor is leading the team in RBIs, and he's—I think he's leading the the National League in ribbies, ribbies. If not, he's in the top three. And twenty-two of his fifty home runs, career home runs with the Mets, have either tied the game or given the club a lead. This Matthew Brownstein dude on Twitter—he just gives out such clutch stats, so key stats, tasty stats. Love those stats. I, pretty much every single little fun fact I'm I'm throwing your way is from Matthew Brownstein on Twitter, who I guess is with Metsmerized. I don't even know if they have a pod. Sad, right? Sad. Uh, we mentioned Starling Marte stealing a lot more bases. He has seven already in the season. I guess if you want to extrapolate that, right? You go uh, May, June, July, August, September. It's five more months. He's not done yet. Can he get to 50 stolen bases this season? Probably not. Just because he hasn't, he's just, he's, he gets dinged up, man. Like that's, uh, what was it? Stealing third, he slides head first and he like hits his head against the guy's knee. And then he, there's like whiplash. He bends it back. The glasses fly off. So he had some kind of a neck strain. He had to leave the game. And, uh, I don't think he played the next day, but 
you know, that's going to be like we said last October when recapping the season and the Padres series, wildcard series. Like, I know I said that if Alonzo and Lindor go off, it's like we don't lose, but we could lose. And it seems like Marte is the secret ingredient. At least he was last season. So we'll see. Um, like I said, Beatty was tearing it up in the minors. You also hear about Mark Vientos and Ronnie Mauricio tearing it up in the minors. I feel like every day I'm seeing another clip of them going yard. And so that to me is just reassuring. It's like, okay, so we haven't completely mortgaged our future. And apparently we have some trade bait, you know, that Mauricio, I guess, and Vientos because Vientos is a third baseman, right? Pretty sure. And then Vien- uh, Mauricio is a shortstop. And so the only way that, you know, you see, I would think that maybe Mauricio has a better shot of being part of the Mets long-term future and that Vientos isn't considering Beatty is up and playing and uh, appears to be the guy at third. So I would uh, suspect that Vientos is the guy that uh, is, is dangled to on the, on the market. But even Mauricio, we're trying to think that through like, okay, well, we have McNeil. I guess you could throw McNeil in the outfield and then put Mauricio at second. If Lindor ever needs an off day, which is rare, he could play short and then you you don't really need him at third. Eh, it's just, uh, I guess right now there's no, the, 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 the silver lining or like the positive spin, the upside here is that the good thing is champagne problems. We, like, we don't need him up here. So we don't have to worry about it at the moment unless it's like, if we do need him, then like shit's gone sideways and like we're in trouble. <laughs> but right now it's like, let him continue to dominate and crush down there. And then maybe he gets the late year call up so he can actually be around the team and see what it's like. And, and maybe that happens a couple times if that's even allowed. I don't know. Baseball has so many friggin' stupid rules. But like if this is the year where like he comes, can he be a September call up this year and next year? I'm fine with that. He's like 21. 22 you know if he comes up at 25 when mcneil has hung him up or has moved on i'm cool with that <laughs> so we talked about francisco alvarez struggling and being really underwhelming in his first few uh games here i think he's uh okay so here it is in four games just take a gander at his batting average he's one for 15 one for 15 which is 0. 0.067 with one uh, ribeye and six strikeouts. I just, I'm going by the eye test alone. He lo- doesn't look like he has a sense of, uh, any degree of confidence or a sense of what to expect at the plate. I was really, uh, disappointed to see him allow that pass ball in Oakland. I believe when Robertson came in, in the ninth, like that seems like an, uh, a fairly easy ball to block. There was a str- a th- called three, uh, a called strikeout. Right? And he didn't think to throw to first. It like took him a while to realize, oh, I got to throw to first. And then he throws the first into bad throw to the point where I think uh, Alonzo had to come way off the base and then dive for it to like, I-, I don't know. It's just a lot of his, you know, and again, like I said, this is not the catcher's fault on stolen bases, but like he's never going to throw anyone out. I know he got some kudos and compliments from the booth on like a couple throws, but like he is just... No shot of of taking <laughs> of throwing anyone out. So it's just it. There's not a lot of other than the one RBI. There hasn't been a lot to like be excited about. But then again, how many players? You know, they mentioned it on We Got to Believe. How many players have come up and lit it up in their first game, and then we never hear from them again? You know, it's a it's a he's only twenty one, so we have a lot of time left with him. Um, but damn man. I could be wrong, but the top prospect in baseball, he comes up and it's been it's been like a dud. I get it. He's young. You got to give him time. You got to give him more than four games. But that small sample set has been rotten to the core. So we'll see. I mean, Nito's not playing much better. So, uh, you know, I guess the pitching staff is more comfortable with Nito and that's what he's got going for him. But uh, it'd be nice if Alvarez... I don't know what's what it's going to take for him to get out of the funk, but it's it's overall, and maybe this is a positive, like a plus, is like his demeanor seems very casual, laid back. Like uh, when he's catching and when things are happening, it just seems like he's it doesn't a lot affect him. I don't know. Maybe that's the, you know, Eli Manning was that way, so, and he won two Super Bowls. So it's like, maybe it's a good thing. It just, when when you're struggling and not performing, people are like, 
does this guy care? <laughs> I remember in my last Mets pod that I did, Mets cast, we were talking about, okay, Peterson versus McGill, who would you rather have? And it turns out they need them both anyway. But like entering the season, coming off spring training, like Peterson had a better spring training. And so I thought, okay, he's a lefty. He's a little more experienced. I think uh, I'd go with Peterson over McGill. And uh, of course I was wrong. McGill has shined. 3-0, 2.25 ERA. Well, Peterson's one one and two with an ERA over six, and he's giving up a ton of hits. I want to say it's almost 12 hits per nine innings, something like that. So hopefully Peterson gets that worked out. Um, but if McGill can just give us, I mean, it's I don't see him pitching this way at that level the entire season. But if he can continue to uh, churn out these kind of starts, it's going to be like, oh, it's going to be so good. <laughs> oh, yeah. We just need, I mean, we basically need one of these guys to to uh, pick up the slack and to be the next man up. And it looks like it's McGill at this point. So if Peterson can get on track, it's just just good. Very reassuring. And then, you know, I had my doubts. I had my, a lot of doubts about a lot of the signings and a lot of uh, the new acquisitions that the Mets made over the offseason. And one of them was Kodai Senga, who is becoming like one of my favorite players on the team. <laughs> he's averaging almost 12 Ks per nine. He's run into some bumps. You know, there have been some issues early on in games and people like lose their minds and freak out. And then he settles down and he does what he does best. In terms of the most strikeouts on an individual pitch, his ghost fork is 16 which is fourth behind Joe Ryan's four seam fastball, Kevin Gaussman's splitter, and uh, the goat. Or should I say, or should I say, the goof in his four seam fastball? Hitters, how are they doing versus the ghost fork this season? They're one for 14, which is uh, about what Francisco Alvarez is hitting. 12 strikeouts with a 60% whiff rate. I think that was last week or the week before. So those numbers might have changed, but still, the ghost fork. For all the hype, it's legit. And maybe this is a maybe it's a case of like hitters, like it's not gonna take hitters very long to catch on to it. And like word's gonna spread and the gospel will be spread. And you know, the missionaries will will spread the good word about the ghost fork and it won't last this won't last all season. But damn, it'd be cool if it did. I you know, I, I just love like the athlete logos, athletic logos, athlete logos, whoever that Twitter account is, who does all the neons for the Mets. Like he created the Ghost Fork logo, it looks great. They have them printed out and they were hanging them up before they get torn down in Oakland. And the Sega, Sega, like the Sega logo that are in the startup from the 16-bit system. They have that like with the N in there. So it's Senga. I mean, it's just like, there's a lot to love about this team. So that's why it's weird for, for some Mets fans and I don't, I don't see them much, so I don't know. And but then again, I don't have, a, I don't have any followers on social media, so maybe that's why I'm not popular and people don't talk to me. But it feels like the most of the accounts that I follow on Twitter and Mets accounts all have the are, are pretty much in agreement about a lot of things, and it's all positive and right. Like it's sane, logical, not flying off the handle, not you know after one little thing goes wrong. And then there's this whole other f weird faction of Mets fans, quote unquote, that just go nuclear every time something happens. And like, I do believe that it's real because my mom is like Frank the Tank from Barstool Sports. Like she is that. Like she's just constantly like, oh my God, Pete's been awful this season. I'm like, mom, 40 home runs, 120 RBIs, like clutch guy. What? What? I don't understand what I'm missing here. Why do you think he stinks? <laughs> it's just like, I have to fact check her like, uh, you know, a lot of fans had to uh, fact check Frank, the tank. Um, so I, you know, I think Singa is awesome. Scherzer has been another story. He's kind of like our four at this point. <laughs> it's like, yeah, McGill is doing probably the best. Then you have Kodai Senga. And then maybe, I guess it is Scherzer, then Peterson and uh, Carrasco has been just absolutely awful. I know Scherzer missed his last start for this versus the A's. He got a little, not hot, but he was very assertive in his response to the media saying like, this is nothing like it is going to, it's going to work itself out. But I mean, it's like, yeah, why would you push him into a start where he's not feeling a hundred percent against Oakland? And sure enough, Jose Buto comes up out of nowhere and gives us a great game, an outstanding outing that, um, that would be, Awesome if that's his like role is to be the spot starter when the when the old farts go down for 10 days to 15 days, two starts. 
to have him come in and uh and pitch uh lights out. Steve Nagosik too. Like well, I think that we are gonna we're gonna we're gonna lament the loss of Trevor Williams for sure. But it does feel like Steve Nagosik like has shown that he can come in and pitch long term, you know, long relief and and do all right. So uh I feel good about that. And then to to know that you can dial up Buto and get a quality start out of him against some of the you know, the Oakland A's of the league and get a win and get a win there. That's great. But yeah, it, I mean, it is. I mean, hey, that was one of my major concerns coming into the season was uh, Verlander and Scherzer getting up in age. Carlos Carrasco, uh, I got this is another bold prediction. I think he's going to get DFA'd this year or he's he's going to go to the bullpen or they're going to try and trade him. I, I cannot see him as a starter for the entire season. And, you know, I know there are some people who are like, well, dude, you, you're a hypocrite because you said like it's too early to make big decisions on this. And, um, you know, with McNeil struggling, you're not saying blah, blah, blah. I just think you're start you're seeing a regression and it's over time and it's not a short time frame. We've seen enough of his degradation of talent that we I feel confident saying that he's not going to be a starter in rotation come I don't think he's going to make the playoff roster. Is he, he's got an ERA approaching nine. He's is 0 and two, has only eight strikeouts and three starts, which is lowest among the starting rotation. Three hit by pitch. Like, is that intentional? What is that? Like, so the control is not there, and uh, you, I mean, control is like paramount regardless. But uh, especially when you don't have quite the same velocity on your fastball or the movement on your off speed stuff. Like, when your changeup is only three miles per hour slower than your fastball, that's a problem. That's an issue. So, um, another gem stat, fun fact from, I think it's Matthew Brownstein again. He, uh, Carrasco's just not getting ahead in the count. Carrasco's first pitch strike percentages since 2018, 64.9, 65.4, 63.9, 64.6, 68.4, 45.2. I understand it's only three starts, but Jesus. What is that saying? One's a thing, two's a bah, three's a trend. Like, Cookie's a trend. He's trending in the wrong direction. I guess Justin Verlander should be returning if this month, or if not this month, definitely next month. It'll be cool to see him in a uniform. I didn't really watch spring training, so I didn't get to see him deal. But again, my concerns are there, you know? Uh, again, choose one, A versus B. A, all this bullshit's happening in September. Or B, all this, all this uh, crazy crap is happening to us in April. I'll take April, and you should too. Let's get all this toxicity out of the city. You know, let's just okay, yeah, just get it out of your system. Sure, yep, a terrace strain. I didn't even know what the friggin' terrace major was, but it's a muscle that connects the scapula to the upper arm. Okay, sure. Um, I've learned more about the human body thanks to Mets injuries than anything else in the world. Any medical dictionary, any Wikipedia, any YouTube video. Mets injuries are always so new and unheard of and unique. <laughs> it's just like thoracic outlet. Oh, okay. Anal fissures. Right. Because that was a thing prior to five seconds ago. Um, so, I mean, so Verlander's trending in the right direction for return. And, uh, you know, I'm completely fine with Verlander and Scherzer feeling things out and then for the entire first half of the season. If Scherzer continues to pitch at this clip where, like, he's in that four ERA range, I'm okay with that. If it gets above five for an extended period of time, yeah, I'm a little worried. But if it's low fours, high threes, I'm fine with that. And you might, and I, dude, I know what you're going to say. Well, what the fuck? We're paying him, uh shit ton of cash 45 mil we're not doing that so that he can pitch and give up three runs and four runs you know and have a four era i'm saying in the first half my man first half that's okay second half like look at how the rotation fared was just crushing 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 and then september came around and they fell a friggin part i want the opposite of that moving on to the bullpen David Robertson has been stellar. Eight games, zero ERA, four saves, nine Ks. He's the first Mets pitcher in franchise history to not allow a run or a walk while striking out at least nine batters in his first seven games of the season. That's crazy. And this, you know, that was another guy along with Senga where I was like on the fence. I was like, I don't know. I just, a lot of doubt. Age played a factor. I was just like, I, you know, I'm fine if we don't sign him. And now it's like, you know, we people were so worried about the bullpen after the Diaz injury. 
And they were like, is Robertson our closer now? Robertson's a setup man. And, uh, you know, Buck has already said it's going to be a closer by committee. So Robertson has four saves. And then guess who has the other two saves? Adam Adovino. 1.29 ERA. And the movement he is getting on those pitches is art. It's art. It's magic and it's art. It's the magic arts. He's a witch. So uh, pretty pleased with how he's performing. So if you can get, I mean, like I said, over the course of a season, Things are going to go up and down and left and right. And it's, you know, it's the stock market. So I would say I'm uh, bullish on them now. And it's great what they're doing now. But you have to realize that they're going to come back to the earth and they might go through a stretch. We just we just have to make sure that the, t- the timing lines up for the upswing in October. It's good to see that Drew Smith has been solid. I know that uh, there were some people that are pretty high on him, but it was like, I felt like every time he's in the game, he does really well really well and it gives up a massive home run to tie the game you're like oh what but you just struck out the previous two guys what happened there so uh it's good to see that he's pulling his own like i said i love steven Nagosik. i love the stash i love that he's able to give us multiple innings and uh and not and limit the damage so great Brooks Raley has been brutal. I haven't really seen him throw much, but I think just looking at his, his stat line, it's like he's got to get things under control. I didn't realize that he was 35. Well, a lot of talk about age on this pod. This it's uh, yeah, I'm, I apologize. A Jimmy Yakabonis, dude. Never heard of him for a, even a second before he appeared on my screen during that game against the A's. But holy shit, held his own, and we got the win. Shout out Yakabonis. Denny, Denny, Denny. Reyes has also been pitching very well and could be our, our weapon X, secret weapon. Dennis Santana, we picked up from the Twins, has been DFA'd already. He had an ERA over 7, 10 Ks, but gave up two home runs and five walks. Whoa. So, those are the Metros. I'm feeling good. It just And it's okay if we get injured. It's okay. Still early. I'm telling you. I'm not going to sit here and lose my shit about a team that is 11 and 6. <laughs> With everything that's happened, and uh, if they lose their next twenty games and we're eleven and twenty six, woof, yeah. But I don't, I cannot, and I just cannot envision that happening. And now that I've said it, it's gonna come to fruition. Cool. So that's the Mets.